friends from India. Uh, we are here for the second day of our symposium, uh, Educating Future Lawyers for uh, Just and Sustainable Society. We had a brilliant uh, sessions yesterday, uh, Professor uh, Krishna Dev Rao, Professor Lisa Vlees and Catherine Klein, including and Professor MRK Prasad gave a nice presentation. And we discussed yesterday about the interdisciplinarity of uh, clinics and of course, how to use the arts in uh, promoting social justice in the law schools. Uh, today, we also have uh, uh, Professor Susan uh, Brooks with us, Professor Asha Bajpay, Professor Sarsut Hemas, and uh, Mr. Abhiraj is uh, likely to join with us uh, very soon. Uh, okay, Abhiraj has already joined. Welcome, Abhiraj. And uh, uh, this is the second day of our symposium, and this symposium that we intend to, I mean, we, we plan along with uh, uh, South Asian Network on Justice Education. So I may request uh, uh, Professor Sarsu Thomas to speak for a minute about what is Sanjay, because there may be few people who have joined today and they may not be there yesterday. So if uh, Sarsu ma'am can uh, speak for a minute about Sanjay, because this is the event which uh, we are organizing in association with uh, uh, South Asian Network on Justice Education. And this network is basically the brainchild of uh, Abhiraj Nayak, Asha Bajpai, Sarsu Thomas. And we had an R gauge conference, a regional gauge conference uh, last year in Nirma. And then as a as an outcome, we thought to have the similar kind of a network in order to promote uh, clinical legal education, to strengthen the legal edu clinical legal education and to provide training and, you know, create a cadre of clinician in this region. So with this purpose, we had this thing. Uh, Professor Sarsu, if you can uh, speak some a minute or so on behalf of Sanjay. I, I could, but I uh, would like to defer to Asha Bap here. If you'd like to start, I can jump in. <laughs> uh, uh, Sarsu, I think I, in, my, in my presentation itself, I have included Sanjay. Oh, so all right. <laughs> I could do it then. I could do it then. Yeah, sure. Want, okay. But just... Okay. Okay, I think uh, if uh, I think if Asha is Asha Ma'am is dealing with uh, Sanjay in her presentation, I don't want to say much, but I mean I uh, don't think it was our brainchild as such. Uh, it you know started off with you know a small uh, it not small event that we had uh, in Nirma, and we just got talking and thought that it would be good to get uh, people in South Asia together that we could have a network for justice education. Uh, maybe on the lines of gauge, maybe something that is, uh, you know, unique to the South Asian region. So it is still uh, very flexible. We still don't have a constitu uh, constitutional document. Uh, and I hope many of you will be uh, part of our journey as we go towards uh, creating uh, this, uh, you know, platform for all of us to meet more uh, frequently on uh, online as well as offline. Uh, with that, let me stop here because, uh, I do know now that, uh, you know, Asha Ma'am has given us a glimpse into her presentation. She'll be dealing with it in greater detail. But I also see Abhairaj uh, having joined. So would you like to say a couple of sentences about Sanjay? Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Sarsu. I think, uh, I think your introduction is nice and I don't want to, in any sense, uh, take uh, anything away from uh, what will come later. So I just... Uh, Maybe the only element I'll convey is uh, uh, it's uh, an experiment and uh, it's emergent. So we don't really uh, have a full sense of where uh, uh, the South Asia Network for Justice Education will go. And, uh, and therefore, uh, it makes it both an exciting journey and a slightly scary journey. And therefore, as many uh, travelers on the journey as possible would be uh, uh, comforting for all. So, so I'll uh, join uh, uh, Dr. Sarsu in just extending that invitation to everyone here to, to help build this network in the uh, weeks and uh, months and years ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Abhairaj. You know, uh, let me welcome uh, Professor Mohammed Haq is also there, who was there with us during our conversation on uh, on Sanjay meeting in our uh, regional gauge conference. Uh, uh, Professor Haq is from uh, University of uh, Dhaka, Bangladesh. And welcome, Professor Preeti Saxena, to this meeting. 
Uh, now over to Arpit, uh, because I really do not want to take much of the time of the sessions. We have four speakers and we really wanted to uh, have the sessions meaningful with them. Yeah. Thank you so much, ma'am. And uh, uh, welcome to the International Symposium on Educating Future Lawyer for Just and Sustainable Society. So uh, in the initial minutes, I'm going to introduce all the four resource person uh, along with the topic. And uh, I am starting uh, with the, the, I'm starting with the Professor uh, Susan L. Brook. Uh, uh, so Professor Brook is Associate Dean and Experiential uh, Learning and Clinical Professor of School of Law Drexel University. She has uh, 30 years of experience as an educator, facilitator, presenter, trainer, uh, just switching to the present uh, and the professional development. She holds JD degree from uh, New, uh, New York University and uh, MA in the clinical social work from University of Chicago. Uh, Professor Brooke is the licensed attorney, mediator, trained peacemaker, uh, circle creeper and uh, certified social worker, certified yoga mindful teacher. Uh, she prom uh, she's a promoter of uh, relational lawyering through writing and conducting workshop development of tools, etc. across the globe. Her topic of presentation today is uh, teaching relational lawyering to promote social justice. So we welcome you, uh, Professor uh, Suzanne uh, Brook, uh, for this uh, uh, symposium. The second resource person uh, for this event is uh, Professor Dr. Asha Vajpayee, ma'am. Uh, she's the former professor, now the visiting faculty at uh, Institute of uh, at Tata Institute of Social Science and Institute of Law, Nirmal University. Uh, professor Asha uh, was the founder dean of School of Law at uh, uh, Mumbai. She designed a master in law curriculum titled Access to Justice to prepare community lawyers uh, providing social justice to the community. She designed and organized access to justice and legal services in marginalized community. She is recognized as a national and international expert on child and youth rights. She uh, appointed as an amicus curiae in the Bombay High Court and, uh, ex and also in the expert committee of Delhi High Court. She was the member of first steering committee of CAGE and attended and made several presentations at CAGE conferences. Her topic is justice for all and clinical legal education. Uh, we welcome you, ma'am, for this uh, event. Now, now I just uh, uh, would like to you know, introduce uh, the third resource person, uh, Professor Dr. Sir Suester Thomas. Uh, Ma'am is the Registrar and Professor of Law, National Law School of Indian University, Bangalore. Her area of specialization include human rights law and family law. Uh, she was a British Council Fellow for Preacher Training Program at Cardiff in 2004. Also the visiting professor at uh, Royal Institute of Technology, uh, Stockholm, Sweden. She has served as a consultant to uh, United Nations Organization on Drug and Crime part of expert group on trafficking case database on UNODC winner. And she's also a member of steering committee of planning commission of India, national advisory council and national commission for women. Uh, the title of, uh, the, uh, of her presentation of today is uh, new education policy and its relevance. We welcome you ma'am for this event. Uh, now I would like to uh, uh, I would like to introduce uh, Professor Abhiraj Nayak. Uh, he's an advisor, consultant, researcher, and uh, also the visiting faculty at uh, Azim Premji University, Bangalore. Uh, Professor Nayak is a co-founder of uh, Initiative for Climate Action, a non-profit that promotes uh, transformative uh, system changes in the response to climate crisis. Professor Nayak teach uh, courses on climate change, ecology, justice, Dev, uh, justice development and law. His core interest uh, in the education for transformation in developing uh, uh, competence and context for justice for the proliferation of uh, human rights. He also designed and lead the development of uh, innovative uh, interdisciplinary and experiential learning program at uh, Azim Premji University. 
he is also a member of gauge and start active engagement with sanjay and also as he mentioned that participated in um, the future of justice education in south asia at amdabad in 2019 he also designed innovative online education modules and system the uh, topic of uh, presentation is uh, design transformative justice education uh, reflection and insight uh, we welcome you sir for this event Now I'll switch over uh, to the first uh, uh, presenter, uh, Professor Susan Brook. Thank you so much. Um, I want to just extend my uh, thank you to, to uh, Professor Purvi for the invitation and uh, thank you to all of you for being here this evening. Um, and uh, I know uh, we all have now many long days often with with a lot of zoom calls so i appreciate all of you sticking around uh, or coming on in the evening to be a part of this um i was uh, i i would love to see if people are willing to just put in the chat you know kind of what where where you're affiliated the what you teach you know if you want to uh put that into the chat i'll i'll take a look at that i'll try it's hard to do do things at once of course but um I also want to uh, just, uh, you know, share some appreciation with for my uh, fellow uh, presenters uh, who are also, uh, I think, you know, most of them involved with GAGE, which is an organization I'm also connected to. And uh, I was uh, just chatting as we started the call with Professor Asha, who um, I met uh, on my first visit to India, which was about 25 years ago. Um, and I've been back there many times since. Uh, um, and just to have a lot of uh, fond fondness for the many different experiences I've had and people I've met, and so I'm I'm really just delighted to be a part of this um, part of this event. So I'm going to go ahead and um, share my screen. I hope that works. <laughs> I think um, let's let's see. Uh, oh, it says that I am not allowed to share my screen. So I wonder if um, maybe I can be made a, a host or co-host. Ah, there we go. All right, so I'm going to um, uh, kind of use this, uh, this little presentation to help guide me and keep me um, on track, and I don't want to use more more time than than I've been asked to use, which is I think about twenty minutes. So, somebody wave at me when I when I get close to that. Um, so I wanted to uh, talk with with you this evening about this approach that I've been developing uh, really over the last twenty years, I guess. But in some ways, uh, since I entered uh, the field of law and legal education, which was closer to thirty years ago. And I call it relational lawyering, and we'll talk about what that means in a moment. Um, and I want to um, really focus my, my remarks and um, offer some tools for how I connect this idea of, of teaching or helping students cultivate relational skills as a way of um, promoting and connecting to ethics uh, of social justice and, and um, interests of so social justice. So uh, one of the kind of important principles, I suppose, uh, or, uh, uh, that I'm drawing from um, is, is something that uh, has been articulated by a writer named Adrian Marie Brown. And um, it's interesting that the, the idea of emergence was mentioned here already in terms of your, your new organization. She has a wonderful uh, book and, and other work, but but the, the book I'm drawing from mostly is, is one called Emergent Strategy. And she says, what we practice at the small scale sets the pattern for the whole system. So really, that is that is really my theme for today, is that um, how we can help students uh, cultivate these personal skills, really, um, is something that has these ripple effects uh, really for the larger systems in which they're operating and um, can have big impacts, I think, over time 
um, even at the level of social change. Um, she also, uh, one, of the, one of the other uh, statements that she, that she says that, that really resonates for me is this idea that what we pay attention to grows. So the idea being that um, if we put our energy toward uh, creating and generating um, new ideas and um, in, in positive social change, then that, that is what will grow. Um, that is what will, will emerge. And um, so I'll leave it there for now and I'll say a bit more um, in a moment. So this is kind of the little roadmap for the, for the next, you know, 15 minutes or so. Um, so I'm going to, you know, focus on, you know, kind of with you defining this idea of relational lawyering and then connecting that to social justice and then offering some teaching and approaches and tools that I find useful. So um, I wanted to, whoops, I wanted to, um, maybe I'll stop the share for a moment and just invite into the chat box, um, what, when you hear the term relational, um, what, what does that uh, conjure up to you? And maybe you can just put the words or phrases in the chat box that come to mind when you hear the word relational. So I'll, I'll look and see, and hopefully these will start to come in uh, to the chat. Take a moment, think about, so I see connection, Just other, other words, terms, phrases that contextual, self and other. These are great. <laughs> other words, terms that, that come to mind when you hear the word relational. Associate, our interactions with others. Maybe we can get a few more. Interpersonal, comparative, interrelated. So these are all great. Um, so when I uh, have used the term relational, let me go back now and I'll just uh, share my screen again. So I want to tell you a little bit about sort of the way that I think of this term relational and how I connect that to the idea of social justice. So this is actually the image that I often uh, use and present uh, to students. And in fact, you know, I know that we're talking a lot about clinical legal education and I am um, currently uh, teaching. So was a um, mm -hmm. And I would also um, offer or invite that um, that that these approaches, what I'm going to share with you today, I think uh, have a bearing on all law teaching, um, and maybe you know even beyond the field of law, uh, are useful for thinking about human interactions and how we situate our, ourselves and our work in the world. Um, so that you see these three, this Venn diagram with three overlapping uh, circles and. Um, I, I would credit this to uh, a group called yesworld.org, which I can tell you more about, um, that have compiled um, over, over 30 years um, many tools for uh, sort of self-development self and for social change. And, um, and so the point of this is really that the personal, the interpersonal, and the systemic are all interconnected. And um, what I want to emphasize for today is the idea that how I am with myself, literally how I am with myself, has these ripple effects for how I then interact with other people at an interpersonal level. And then those interpersonal interactions have broader ripple effects on the larger systems in which we um, are situated. So that's really a kind of foundational um, kind of image and, and uh, a set of assumptions, I think, underlying this idea of relational lawyering. So out of that, I, I have, uh, you know, I've developed, I've written a bit about this idea and arrived at a set of principles and practices 
that connect up with the idea of, of what it means to be relational. Um, so the first is really in some ways more than one idea, but it really is about approaching others with a kind of curiosity, but, but curiosity informed by kindness. So, you know, we're going to talk, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the idea of uh, suspending judgments and being aware of assumptions and judgments. I think if we approach others first, if we lead with this idea of kindness and curiosity, then that can help us to uh, uh, be aware of when we're starting to become more reactive or, or exercise assumptions or judgments. Um, the second principle is this idea that everyone wants to matter. Um, and it's, it's been researched as, uh, as this kind of topic of mattering. So, you know, it's a, it's a fundamental aspect of, of human dignity, of, of, of uh, what it means to be a human that we all want to be seen and heard. So to me, this is also a fundamental principle of being relational. Um, the third principle, and, and by the way, these are ideas that I think were, were referred to in some of the, some of the, uh, the words and phrases that came into the chat uh, context. Uh, and so I think uh, being relational really means appreciating the importance of context and, and culture, of course, is a very important uh, part of context. Um, the fourth principle is uh, approaching uh, others and ourselves from a standpoint of strengths and assets, um, being able to see our own inner strengths and, and honor them. And also, I think the more we do that, then we can honor other people's strengths. And this also connects with the idea of um, what we pay attention to grows. So if we pay attention to what's working, what's going well, actually we can, we can generate more of that. Um, I think this is very countercultural for, for the legal profession in particular, because we're so oriented toward problems and risk. Um, and so I think often we, we, we may miss opportunities uh, by, by taking that kind of more pessimistic lens. Um, and then the, the fifth principle is, is a basic idea that, that care and caring um, is, is a value that, we, that I think is important to bring into, into every interaction. So out of these principles, I've developed some core practices. And um, these are some of the ways that I refer to them. You know, uh, one is, is this idea of seeking permission. So, when we are engaging in an interaction and particularly a challenging interaction, or maybe when we're in conflict uh, around something to make sure that we have, uh, that, we're, that we and whoever we're interacting with are at least ready for the conversation. And that's really what the idea of permission is. It's creating the conditions around uh, the work that we're doing um, that, that, that involves consent really by the other person. Um, stretching, I'll talk about in a moment, um, being present, uh, staying present, uh, slowing down, noticing, which is all a part of uh, mindfulness. Um, you know, the, they talk about the importance of pausing. Um, uh, so these, again, are, these are tools and practices, which I'll, I'll try to share just a little bit more about. Um, bringing empathy and compassion and self-compassion. Um, tools for self-reflection, and also uh, self-directedness. So, I mean, I'm giving a very, a very kind of overview kind of sketch of this. Obviously, I could talk a lot more about it, but I'll give you kind of the, the, the framework, and then um, I'm happy to answer questions or discuss more uh, as, it, as it makes sense. Um, so one of the ways that I've taught about what it means to be relational is to contrast that with the idea of what it means to be transactional. Because I think probably most of us who are in the legal profession uh, know, uh, in, in, in law teaching, legal education, know what it means to be adversarial, <laughs> to be argumentative. Um, and that's kind of at one end of a continuum. But I think often uh, what we miss is this idea that, that you know, we can tend to be um, transactional in our work, um, which is not the same as being relational. So the idea of of uh, you know, promoting everything that we're doing as um, 
these kind of arm's length transactions where we're checking a box, you know, getting the work done. Um, and, and that I think can inform a lot of legal work, unfortunately, um, I would say, unfortunately, because uh, I, I think, again, it's this idea of the missed opportunities. Um, whereas, you know, when we're, when we're acting from a place of interconnectedness and mutuality, um, we, we have these opportunities, I think, to, to generate and create. Um, so I, I, you know, in connecting this with social justice, um, I think about uh, these four ideas that uh, Brian Stevenson, um, who is uh, famous in the U.S. as both an attorney and a writer, um, he has a book called Just Mercy, which maybe maybe you, you're familiar with. Um, but uh, he talks about these four things we can do to make the world more just. And I see them as connected to uh, these ideas of what it means to be relational. Um, so he talks about getting proximate, um, getting close uh, to what it is that we, the, the subject or the, the um, the people that we're trying to uh, advocate for or to to help and, and recognizing that we are part of that we're, we're not we're not just uh, separate from those that we're trying to work with um, he talks about staying hopeful you know which I think connects with that idea of, of a strengths orientation he talks about getting uncomfortable um, the need to get uncomfortable so that that goes to this idea of awareness um, stretching um, uh, you know, trying to appreciate context. Um, and really that changing the narrative also uh, has to do with context because, you know, I think uh, what he's talking about is, is really the context of, of the history of racism in the U.S. And, um, and that's an important context, I think, for, for work around social justice and social change, certainly in the U.S., and I'm sure there are parallels um, in, in every other context. Um, so, and this, you know, I show students this, these are now I'm going to kind of show you just quickly some of the tools that I use to, to teach and, and to connect the, the kind of personal with the systemic. Um, and one of them is the, the idea that we need to harness uh, our whole selves to do this work. So not just the analytical reasoning parts of our brains, but also the creative, uh, integrative, um, generative parts of our brains. Um, this is another visual image I use um, that was taken from the work of Gary Friedman. He talks about the idea of uh, going down the V. So like if we start from the surface level with ourselves and whoever we're interacting with, um, then, then we will stay at that kind of a transactional um, level. Going down the V means that we, we have to work through our assumptions and judgments and biases and get uncomfortable and appreciate context. Um, and, and at the same time, honor our strengths and bring compassion, bring kindness. And then we can find these deeper points of connection. And I think that can, that can happen interpersonally and it can happen systemically. Um, so I'm running out of time here, I think, but I do want to at least show you uh, two more things. Um, this is a, a, a tool that I use with students um, in very much uh, trying to create a common language for them in the classroom. Um, and it's a way of uh, actually thinking about personal and interpersonal and systemic. So, you know, at the center is the comfort zone. Um, and, you know, I just talked about the idea, the importance of getting uncomfortable in order to grow and learn and transform ourselves and our societies. Um, so, you know, it's not really so much a judgment, but, but really just to, to, um, to be able to, to help invite some exploration and self-reflection around the idea that, that in order to grow and to learn and to make change, we have to stretch, we have to get out of our comfort zone. And yet we don't necessarily, we, we don't necessarily want to move into panic, right? Panic is reactivity, it's overwhelm. Um, and in the panic zone, we're also not learning. Um, and we can see panic kind of manifest itself both personally, <clears throat> interpersonally and systemically. You know, when we think about some of the um, troubling incidents that, that happen out in our societies, I think 
you know, uh, a colleague of mine has described those as, as a form of kind of crystallized panic. And so this is another tool that I think um, is, is a way of bringing a, a kind of trauma-informed lens to the work um, to, to invite some exploration around the idea of what happens when we are in panic. Um, which is, you know, this, this also what, what gets activated uh, through trauma um, and the idea that at that point um, we aren't um, acting from a place of kindness and curiosity, right? We're not acting from a place of learning or growth. Um, and so these are some of the ways that it can show up and, and people talk about fight and flight so you see here the fight axis being kind of this idea of attacking self and others um, and the flight axis being the kind of avoid or withdrawal. Um, so, you know, what do we do about this? Well, we can draw on these resources um, and this is, this is uh, research on resilience research uh, that looks at the individual and, and I think the social level of resilience and these are um, some of the things that, that have been shown to help people navigate uh, and back and, and find strategies for staying in that place of learning. So relationships is one of them, right? Uh, asking for help, um, drawing on our own sense of agency and voice um, and staying hopeful. Um, so again, I, I know I'm going through these very fast, but I'm just trying to give you uh, a flavor. Um, so just as I'm finishing up here, um, you know, there's a whole body of literature about mindset and about how we can actually shift our mindset um, to one uh, that, that encourages this kind of growth and stretching and learning. Um, and so again, these are just, I'm giving you like this huge menu of tools, but this is you know, what I will often uh, cover over the course of a semester with students in different ways. Um, so I wanted to um, just end, <laughs> I know I'm probably over time, but just end with this, um, this final uh, kind of set of, of tools that comes from the work of Joanna Macy, who is uh, an environmental activist and advocate. Um, and she talks about this practice that she calls um, the, the great turning uh, or the work that reconnects. Um, and she describes it as a kind of spiral. Um, and and it, it starts with gratitude. Um, and, and by the way, uh, you know, the, she, the, the dandelion, the choice of the dandelion here is not accidental, right? Because the dandelion represents this kind of cycle. Um, and even going back to uh, Adrienne Marie Brown, who I began with, um, she draws a lot of these lessons about, um, about this idea of, of what we practice on the small scale, sets the patterns for the large scale from nature, from observing what happens in nature. So this, um, this final um, kind of practice brings us back to, to inspiration from nature. Um, so it begins with gratitude. And then um, part of that cycle requires us to um, to actually honor the pain and sadness and suffering that is that is there within us and out in the world. Um, and a lot of times we can tap into anger um, and rage <laughs> about what's happening, the things that are injustices um, and, and, and mistreatment of, of people who are marginalized. And I think um, the, the invitation here is to get underneath that and be willing to also see the sadness and and to honor that um, as, as a way of moving through um, some of these difficult moments. And then uh, as we do that, uh, you know, the, the encouragement to do that in community, in relationship, so that we have others to, to draw support from. Um, and that will allow us really to see the world with new eyes, to see our lives and others with new eyes and to go forth in the world and, um, and to do this difficult work of social change. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, just the final, final thing is uh, Joanna Macy talks about taking the long view. And I think in these days, um, with what we've been struggling with, with this pandemic and, and many other challenges that we're facing in the world right now, 
<clears throat> I think taking the long view can be a very useful strategy and tool and can help us stay uh, kind of in that place of, of growth and learning. So thank you so much. I'm going to stop the share and uh, seed my time. Um, and I apologize if I went a little over. Um, but I look forward to hearing the other presentations and any questions or comments at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. It was a very uh, impressive presentation. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we'll have a couple of uh, questions at the end of the session. Uh, is that fine, uh, Professor Asha, or we would like to take it now? Anyway, anyway, Professor Purvi, either now or later, no problem. Okay, we will complete all the presentation and then we'll uh, make the floor open for the discussion. Okay, now we invite Professor Asha Bajpayee for her presentation. Um, justice for all is, is something is a dream that we need to realize in this country. And Asha Vam has something to offer. Uh, please welcome Professor Asha Bajpayee. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me for this very important uh, conference, webinar. And uh, good morning, good evening, and uh, good afternoon to all who have joined this conference. Um, I'll be speaking on the experiences that I've had and also what needs to be done as far as educating lawyers for justice education uh, is required. I have a small presentation which I would like to share. and. Uh, I'll just begin, share my screen. Uh, is it okay? Is it visible? Not yet, it's coming. I, yes, now it's, it's visible. It's visible, okay. okay. So this is what I plan to do it. It is about how to bring about the change that we are all talking about in our legal education. How do we bring in this change? Some experiences I'm sharing and some I think I'm, it's just a suggestion that I have. I just have a question before I begin. And uh, suppose I, I request you to give your answers in words very briefly in words or phrases in the chat box. Uh, an injustice has been done to you today and you need justice. What options do you have? Please share. Still to get something in the chat box. Any 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 suggestions you have? What will you do? Go to court? Yes. One option. Courts, courts, and court? Yes. See if there is a violation of fundamental right. If yes, approach the court. Internalize the just injustice. Okay. Arbitration. Bringing it to the notice of the perpetrator. Go to the police station. Negotiate with the person, fight at all levels. Okay. Okay, good. Okay. So, so the options that we all have are generally, in most cases, what we have noticed is we have three options. We have three options when we get when an injustice is done to us. The first option is you look at a lawyer, look out for a lawyer. Now this lawyer may be highly priced. You have you all aware there are different lawyers with different price tags, and um, their service services are very arbitrarily priced. Also, you have lawyers up to ten lakhs per per hearing, or up to up to ten thousand per hearing. You have um, and you are not aware of any specific outcome at the end of all this. That's the first option that you have, and so you have lawyers and lawyers, and the case may go on and on and you keep on paying and waiting for justice. That's the first option, which many of you have said about courts. The second option is that you can avail of informal advice, go to a family friend, go to an experienced family member or neighbor or politician or, or such people and, uh, and get their advice, an informal advice. This will be an informal advice, not sure, you, you may not be sure what it is what is it is illegal, illegal, formal, informal. The third option that you have is turn to some version of legal aid service or law school clinic. 
you have legal services, the district legal services, national legal services, state legal services, taluka legal services. That are the services that we have. And or you have a law school clinics who many times give um, uh, advices. Now, um, you may be aware that if uh, these legal services clinics, many times the view is, perception is that you want to lose a case, take a legal aid lawyer. Those kinds of perceptions are there. And it may be not of quality and of standard that you normally get. So, and if you go to a legal aid clinic, then what happens is many of these legal aid clinics do not have structured programs. Some are part-time, some are weekend, some are uh, in the evening, some are on certain days, or in some law schools I have seen there are just boards of the clinics, but no clinics behind the board. So no wonder you hear, you want to lose a case, go to legal aid lawyer, go to law school clinics. What is common about these options, you may have noticed, is that they are arbitrary and vague for the victim, especially, creating further loss of confidence in our legal system and our justice system. And so we often hear, oh, we do not want to fall into the hustles of the legal system. Nothing happens. It goes on for years and years. And after that, we don't get any justice. So this is the thing that we normally hear when we talk about this. So the people who are hardest hit by this kind of options that we have are the vulnerable and the marginalized one who do not have any support network. Many of them, many of us may approach lawyers, we have support networks, but they do not have. So these marginalized and, um, uh, and uh, you know, disadvantaged groups who are always um, often victims of abuse, exploitation, neglect, and violation of their rights, are women, children, elderly, disabled, persons living with HIV AIDS, minorities, unorganized labor. And these are the people who are hardest hit. So now what, do, what is needed? So what is our legal education today? Generally focuses on market trends. We all are aware of it and that is, that's, the, that's the practice and that's the trend now. So community needs of justice are often undermined. You have kind of legal uh, services clinics, you have legal aid programs, which are voluntary, which are ungraded, which are not evaluated. Teachers workload are not recognized, not appreciated. So what happens? Uh, absolute disconnect between practicing lawyers, law firms and civil society organizations on one hand and educators, students and educational institutions or law universities on the other hand. So the result is injustice. Injustice prevails, prevails, continues, and goes on continuing. And hopefully, and I think if nothing is done, and I'm glad that this conference has taken place to train future lawyers. If something is done, otherwise it will continue. Um, what is needed? We need an education for justice or justice education. We call it E4J, education for justice. Now, this, this is an ideology that promotes learning by doing. We can implement it through our university programs, full and equal participation of all groups in the society, and also improving the legal capabilities of individuals and builds the capacity of justice system and strengthens legal institutions. I would like to bring in the SDG goal 16 in this, which is one of our goals in that. So strengthening of legal institutions, strengthening of the capacity of educators, and, and also improving the legal capabilities of all individuals in the society. So we have a culture of lawfulness, which, which Professor Susan mentioned. We, we want to know a culture of lawfulness through education activities and encourage students to actively engage in, these, in their communities. Now, what is this culture of lawfulness that we are talking about? Now, clinical legal education, we all mention about it. I, the Constitution of India itself talks about the legal system to facilitate eradication of poverty, inequalities, status of opportunities, and ensure justice to all. This is the preamble itself of the Constitution of India. And it means that this should go to the very fundamental of the justice education that we talk about. And one way of promoting this is through clinical legal education or justice education, which is, and CLE is a part of justice education. So this is what we are talking about when we talk about law students who are engineers of society. 
we call them the engineers of society, social engineers of society. Now, how do they do it? Is it, is it through, um, what is that called? Um, uh, uh, legal aid clinics? Or is it through the curriculums that we are made? Is it through uh, legal education? And seeing that our education includes rights-based approaches, humanitarian approaches that is there, and also uh, which could be an education for justice. I would like to share that if you do uh, just through justice education, what our aim should be is a rather uh, besides a good advocate, a citizen's advocate, a community lawyer, we have sensitive and ethical lawyers and as well students who turn into such lawyers. Now the skills that we could impart for this could be along with the laws that we learn, we also need soft skills that need to be included in the curriculum when we are doing justice education. Soft skills of empathy, being non-judgmental, how to marshal facts in a field situation, writing and documenting and networking skills that we have, we need to have develop in them, understand the client's problem, client interviewing as it is called, client counseling, ability to argue logically, disseminate information, applying the law into field situations, use of databases, the various databases that we have, how could they use these databases while working in the field, analyzing law reports and teamwork. These are some of the soft skills also that could be included when we are talking about educating lawyers for justice education. I'm going a bit fast because I have a limited time. Uh, sharing experiences of a university and a community-based clinic that I was running. And I would like to share an uh, example that came there, a uh, problem that came there, a case study that came there. This is a person called Ram Chandra. I've changed the name. He was a resident of slum, supporting a family of eight living in a city. The municipal corporation was expanding a road and his house fell within that area. This is a common thing that happens and many of you are aware of it. Because of this, Ramchandra was provided with accommodation in a temporary housing tenement. So, but when he went there, he saw that another tenement, another person had illegal obtained possession and was staying there, occupying it. When our students visited the community as part of their fieldwork placements through, through an NGO working in that area, they identified this case. They brought all his papers to the clinic. After studying the papers, we realized that the opponent had instituted a court case against Ramchandra and there was an order in Ramchandra's favor, giving him a legal title to the tenement. Unfortunately, the municipal corporation had not executed this order. As a result, he was unable to stay in his rightful residence. This was the facts of the, of the matter that came to us, one of the cases. Now, how would you go about this matter as students of uh, justice, edu uh, justice, social justice, as justice educators, as faculties to what steps will you take to, uh, to, on this issue? Write your responses very briefly in the chat box if you can, very quickly and very briefly. How would you go about this matter? What do you think should be immediately done? He, there's a court order in his favor, but still nothing has been done. What's the problem? What needs to be done? Any, anybody would like to say anything? Go to municipal authorities with the order, approach the court again and ask for contempt proceedings, higher authority, any other? Okay, going to municipal authorities, fine. Yes. Publish a newspaper. Okay. Uh, so I the letter, let, I'll just share with you what we did. Students were guided by the faculty. They were advised to determine the current legal status of the case and to meet the municipal corporation officials, as many of you have suggested. 
And then after that, they went to the municipal corporation officials, showed them the case and found out what exactly is the status of the matter. They visited the client's residence and helped them with documentation. And first thing they did was they drafted a letter to the assistant commissioner of municipal corporation. The students with the faculty also visited the legal department of the municipal corporation to meet with their lawyers and other officials several times they had to go. It didn't happen in one visit. We filed an RTI application to determine the protocols and procedure for legal eviction. Due to RTI, we found that the time period and the procedure for evocation, what was it? How, how, when can you do it? And brought the matter up before the municipal corporation. So I would like to share with you how we have used various approaches to this. Municipal corporation finally evicted the person who was fraudulently occupying the tenement and Ramchandra was granted permission, possession of his house. Now, lessons that we learned in this case, no protocols or a single clear redressal mechanism for initiating eviction proceedings. There was nothing like that. It was very arbitrarily. Anyone they went, evicted someone, and that was the end of it. On paper, they had rules for eviction proceedings, but the rules were not implemented at all. Ordinary citizens were not aware of the legal rights or how to get orders implemented. They were just not aware of it. There was a law, clear law gap between the law in the book and the law in the field, absolute gap. And especially with these mm, people living in slums, they had no, as I mentioned to you earlier, they had no means to go to the media. They had no means to go write a uh, file RTI application. We had to help them file the right to information application. That was there. Now, what we need is, first thing that we could do for, uh, for students to become justice uh, lawyers or come is social laws for the vulnerable group, which are not implemented as the complainants themselves are unaware of rights and they are very weak. So many of the social legislations are not implemented. So how do you do it? Awareness through simplified laws. We do learn laws and sections, but then they don't understand that. We have to do through simplified laws, which we need to do it, learn and do it through our, when we are doing our legal education. Street plays, as we saw yesterday, puppet shows. There is a puppet show going on. I think 79 shows have gone on on POXO Act. It is a one woman show. But she has explained the entire, she played several low roles in that. And, and the entire POXO Act, she has uh, explained through the puppet shows that she's doing. There are short films, paralegal trainings, and legal counseling. I would like to share with you the street play that we did for conveying to the family court lawyers how to, about the shared parenting um, uh, uh, orders that was even at that time started by the family courts in custody matters, how shared parenting was done because many of them were not appreciative of it and many of them were not aware of it. So this is the court premises, family court premises. You may, you can see lawyers also standing there here in the third picture down. So these, and the students have explained to them what is shared parenting and how these orders through the family court are being given and on what basis. Then we had, a legal, uh, so one of the ways is legal awareness, as I mentioned to you, simplified laws. Just give you a small glimpse of a simplified law that we did on the Child Marriage Act. So the child, this is, we can't say section one and section two. We made pictures, what is child marriage? And we said, if a girl is under 18 and a boy is under 21, even if they can't read, they can see the pictures and they can see. And we did that in different languages, in four languages we did it, Hindi, English, Marathi, and Urdu, so that all the people in the communities are aware of it. What happens when nullity petition is accepted by the court? So both parties return jewelry, a return which they had received during marriage. So this is how we showed the return of the jewelry. Then also boy, his parents may be directed by court to give maintenance and what happens to the baby, what happens to the child. All this we showed through these pictures of the Child Marriage Act. We also did activities on training, paralegal volunteers were trained and also consumer right activists were trained. We also did legal counseling. Anganwadi workers are those field workers who go from door to door in a community. They are these pink sari ones. They are aware of what is happening in each household in their area. So we called them and made them paralegal volunteers, 
a formal paralegal volunteers were giving them their cards after they uh, went through the formal course of being a paralegal volunteer. And they were a great help to us because when they went in the community, their legal knowledge, they disseminated to the community members. This was one initiative that was done through, uh, you must have heard about migrant workers during pandemic, what you we all know there's an interstate migrant work and regulation of employment and conditions of service act 1979 which has provisions to protect mig migrant workers in the time of crisis such as the covid pandemic but no it was not implemented we saw thousands and thousands of migrant workers going going all over the uh, on walking on the streets with their families children women all of them, why? Because the law was not implemented. Much of the information regarding the rail transport was available online, but who will help them in accessing it? For non-payment of wages, they could contact the nearest legal aid office or send an email. And there was also a national helpline by the National Legal Services Authority, but still they were not aware of it. We saw them, many died on the way, many starved on the way. Why was this act not implemented? because they were not aware of their rights or options. This is the gap in which students can step in. Students can step in uh, how, see the rail transport, they were they crowded at railway stations when there were no trains. They crowded at bus stands where there were no buses. But why? Where were, because they were not aware. There were buses, there were trains, but they were not aware of it. So I, many of the students from some universities did contact these migrant workers and made networks through uh, so that they could be made aware of train timings, of rail timings, of transport timings, and also of the rights that they could get the wages through their employers. The employers were given the re responsibility under this 1979 Act to pay them wages, even if there is a pandemic or an emergency that was there. Pandemic was not mentioned, but emergencies are there. So this is another issue that the, the gap that is there that needs to be filled by students and justice educators. Now, the next thing I would like to show is in our legal service, besides legal counseling, legal advice, we also had to give, be facilitators. We had to write letters to various authorities, to police authorities, to railway authorities, to customs authorities, to uh, and briefing of lawyers we did. We did referral to the district legal services authority, lies in with other authorities like the police, the, uh, the uh, ration, rationing authorities. Many of them came to us for rationing. Many of us came to us for RTI applications. Many of us came for Aadhaar card. Many of them didn't get the ration cert. All this came through the legal services. So drafted RTI application, we uh, refer to the panel lawyers, refer to counselors, refer to hospitals, refer all these things were done. We drafted bail applications. We drafted a file have non-cognizable offenses. All these aspects were done. And during this pandemic, many university legal aid clinics had webinars to spread awareness of laws. We had virtual legal aid clinics and we gave counseling through uh, online. We had data collection for migrant workers, as I mentioned to you, how many migrant workers, where they wanted to go. Some of the universities did that, uh, which place they wanted to go, what they needed. We had linkages with stranded people, with NGOs. Many of the universities did that. Government agencies, donors on the web platform. We had counseling by clinical counselors, psychiatrists, and law faculty in resolving family disputes and domestic violence cases, as you all know. Domestic violence cases soared during this time. They increased many times. And then we had a mapping of centers, like quarantine centers, where they are, they did not know. So the students of some universities mapped the quarantine centers, law universities I'm talking, mapped the quarantine centers, uh, mapped the where food was available. Food was being distributed, but they did not know. There were families who were starving, but they did not know where to go for food in the lockdown. Where was the transport? Where was the loan and other services? All this was mapping and dissemination of information. There were several government notifications that were coming again and again and again during COVID-19. So these notifications were collected and compiled and disseminated. Four law schools joined together and uh, 
uh, formed the South Asian regional networks and which Sanjay, which was mentioned to you by Professor Purvi and Professor Sarsu and Professor Abhiraj. So what we did was we, uh, four, we four universities, we Nirma, uh, Ajiz Premji and, um, uh, and uh, Nash, uh, this, uh, National Law School Bangalore and uh, um, the Tata Institute, we joined together and formed a minute work on justice education. As you all are aware, there are several justice education networks throughout the world. You have uh, in uh, UK, USA, uh, Australia, there are various networks, but we wanted a South Asian network and we, and we did not have one for various reasons. There were several attempts made, but it did not work out. But the regional conference at Nirma um, in uh, 2019, I think November 2019, um, uh, brought together uh, many educators and practitioners from across India and South Asia to speak about new approaches, best practices, and uh, collaborative opportunities in justice education. So we had very several clinicians and professors from all over the um, South Asian region. And one of the resolution of the conclave was to initiate a South Asian network for justice education, Sanjay who's collaborating today with Nirma University of Law. So this was, and many of founding members are members of GAGE. And the, we, have a, we had an advisory meeting in which Professor Frank Bloch and many other GAGE members attended it and gave us advice on how to move forward. We are a non-profit, profit, non-governmental organization. And we, our goals are that promoting justice through socially relevant legal and clinical education by empowering educators, students, justice professionals, and citizens. And our, mode, and our motto is inclusion, empowerment, and justice. So this is what Sanjay in brief is about. And uh, so this happened during pandemic, after pandemic, and we, uh, now I would like to speak about the India Justice Report of 2019. In this report, a very significant uh, finding is that 80% of India's 1.25 billion population are eligible for free legal aid, but only 15 million people have availed of it since 1995. Number of states which use their full budget allocation from the National Legal Services Authority is absolute zero. That means there is unutilized fund available. But what is required is vision and action from all our uni legal law universities and our, our justice educators. So my concluding remarks is that the gaps that we have identified, our law students and our law faculty need to fill these gaps. We could make suitable provisions also could be made in the Advocates Act. Because in India, law teachers and law students cannot appear in courts as per the Advocates Act. So we, if we are full-time law teachers, we cannot uh, appear in court. So such provisions we need to make in the Advocates Act. We need a separate cadre of lawyers who act as justice professionals. And for this, we require a team of good faculty, law clinicians, multidisciplinary professors, interdisciplinary professors who can deliberate design and develop innovative curriculum and pedagogies, which requires thorough grounding and grooming of young lawyers, young students. We need effective co collaborations with universities, law firms, NGOs, legal services, which are now working in isolation, many of them. We promote legal skills to enhance teachers' abilities. See, my experience was many of the faculty said, we are not aware what to do as, as uh, clinic teachers, as legal aid, to, uh, as going in the field along with students. Many faculty had the reservation that this is not being uh, graded. We are not getting any, any uh, 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 appreciation for it, nor any credit for it. So why should we do it? This is what I faced when I gave a, when I made it um, credit, I gave 12 credits for a um, legal, a field legal work, clinic course, but they, there was opposition to it. Standards must be laid down for law school clinics. As I told you, in various kinds. Legal services must be given due recognition as a credit course in law schools. They think that no, it's a voluntary course. Mindset of law teachers and law students must be changed through uh, social change, which I think Professor Susan Brooks made, uh, I mean, gave a good presentation. We could use that for that. Legal services is as important as any other course in the curriculum. It is not an optional course. Networking is required. 
So we, this is the words of Professor Menon, which I would like to conclude with. A new breed of lawyers or legal services providers who are capable to identify the dynamics of injustice and unrest in society, forge new tools and techniques for preventing and remedying, remedying injustice, not just to particular clients, but to communities in general. The lawyer then becomes a social engineer, constructing a justice delivery system, which is sustainable in developing and underdeveloped economics, thereby reinforcing faith in the rule of law, faith in the rule of law. I think that's what is lacking at the moment. We need to develop that. And thank you everybody for listening patiently. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Asha Vajpayee, for sharing your wonderful experiences. You have been uh, greatly involved in conducting clinics uh, with the Tata Institute of Social Sciences. And uh, it was a great presentation. Uh, when we hope that, you know, uh, somehow as a part of uh, the uh, Sanjay initiative, probably we may come out, come out with the toolkit uh, for the clinical uh, legal educators, you know, we may provide some kind of a handbook for the uh, fresh uh, new teacher who really wanted to want to do something in for the cause of social justice in the law school. So probably uh, we hope to have this thing uh, somewhere uh, after some of our initiations, some of our workshops. So thank you, Professor Bajpai. Uh, and now I now invite uh, Professor Sarsu Thomas from National Law School, Bangalore. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me. Please give me a thumbs up if you can. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, let me just start off by uh, thanking uh, Nirma University and Purvi in particular for the invitation and uh, for Arpit for introducing me. I must say that I, I was never a member of the NCW though. I have served on a couple of committees occasionally. Um, well, the, since I noticed that most participants uh, were likely to be from India and um, interested in what was happening here and in other parts of the country, I thought I would focus a little bit at the, on the uh, new education policy which we just have. Uh, uh, and I think the session has started off very well. I think yesterday we had remarkable sessions where we uh, learned of experiments in many places and had a chance to participate in interactive work. Today, I, I should thank uh, Susan for setting an academic tone and you know a good theoretical base for uh, subsequent presentations today and for my, uh, for my teacher, I should say. Uh, Asha Vam taught me a long time back when I was a, a BLLB honor student at the National Law School uh, for the wealth of experience that you have shared uh, with us from your different experiments in TIS and in other places. So uh, faced with all this, I knew that, you know, if I'm going to uh, give my two bit, I should probably not talk about my experiences because uh, you've already had uh, so many examples that I cannot compete with in any way. Uh, so I thought I would move to, um, you know, a different track and to see what the country is thinking of when they speak about legal education today and what the country is thinking about when it looks at uh, justice education, what, what the state has in mind when it speaks about uh, justice education. So um, I'm not sure how many of you have already taken a look at the new uh, education policy. Uh, if you can go to reactions and give me a thumbs up. How many of you have gone through the new education policy? All right, I see one thumb. Okay, um, a few thumbs. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so, um, what I would like to, uh, you know, uh, quickly say is that I, I don't want to go through the entire policy, but what I would like to uh, point out is that it probably mentions law some five times. Okay? That, that's all. Uh, but the policy is interesting because it is after a long time that we have a new education policy. You had one in 1968, then in 86, and now you have one uh, in 2020. 
And uh, when we look at the tone and tenor of uh, this policy, we see that those of us who are interested in justice education, um, you know, there are, are some heartening uh, statements that are there, which I would like to pick out and uh, share with you. So um, I hope the screen is visible to all. And uh, what the, uh, I mean, the timing of the policy was very uh, unique. It was in the midst of the pandemic at a time when education itself was under threat, when, you know, regular education that we have in classrooms started looking like a distance mode of education, where uh, inequalities were exacerbated for people. And we were just discussing this before we started on how online uh, teaching was working. And we saw that, um, as far as online teaching was concerned, those who had access to internet, those who were able to go to classes stood better in a better footing as far as receiving education was concerned than others. So this was a strange time to come up with this uh, policy in 2020. Now on legal education, and I promise you, this is the only slide I have with a lot of matter on it. Um, when we look at what it says about legal education, it says, among other things, that it should be informed and illuminated with constitutional values of uh, justice, social, economic, and political. It should be directed towards national reconstruction through democracy, rule of law, human rights. That curricula should reflect socio-cultural context, um, you know, and uh, so on and so forth. It also uh, talked about uh, the language one teaches in, and I will uh, come to that a little later. So it has all these big ideals that all of us have been speaking about in the last two days uh, as the core of what it sees that legal education uh, should be and what it sees as the goal of legal education. Uh, we also see that it has widened the scope of legal education. Uh, very unusually, it has uh, talked about uh, professional legal education, which is of course a common uh, motif maybe, but it has spoken, uh, it does talk about uh, moving legal education out of you know, regular physical classrooms to other kinds of uh, forums like um, uh, MOOCs, okay, which is massive online, open, open online uh, courses and others as well. So it is, opening legal education up from a traditionally taught classroom uh, to newer forms where people who are connected over the internet, much like we are today in uh, today's webinar, uh, would be able to uh, use it. Uh, the other thing it does is also it in a very different context. So I want to admit that I've taken it a little, taken the liberty of taking it, taking it out of context. Uh, when it talks about data, and uh, AI-based technologies, it talks about uh, the fact that it's critical to raise awareness on a number of issues like uh, privacy, law, and so on. And, uh, you know, legal literacy on law continues to be an underlying uh, challenge in a country where literacy itself is not very high. So when we have poor literacy, uh, delivering legal literacy and knowledge of what you are entitled to, and what another is not entitled to is something which is very relevant and some, something that we will find a common factor in most programs dealing with justice educa uh, education, reaching out to um, people uh, to make them aware of the law, to make them aware of their rights as a beginning. Um, now, there are three, uh, there are about four themes that, uh, you know, we see running through this uh, particular document. Uh, some I have mentioned, but I just thought I would put it out there. Uh, the last one, as I said, legal literacy, I've taken it a little out of context, but I still think it is relevant. It speaks about uh, vocational training, something that we uh, have seen over the last two days that, um, you know, training in order to work or basic training so that you can get something done, that you can get your uh, rights implemented. It talks about uh, multidisciplinary work. 
It recognizes the fact that law, like every other uh, discipline, should work in a multidisciplinary manner. And I'll come to that again later. It speaks about bilingual teaching, which is unusual because um, in India, when we look at um, legal uh, learning, it has usually been in English and in some states in Hindi, but teaching in a bilingual um, mode is not something that has ever been done. Um, so it's out there. I don't know how many uh, take it seriously, but uh, it has definitely been uh, mentioned. Now, one question which is useful for us, uh, those of us who are uh, teaching in uh, India, uh, and maybe something uh, which others would also you know, be familiar with is, you know, the path of legal education that we've had in India. So we started off with the first lawyers, the only thing they needed to know was a knowledge of English because then they could communicate a client's needs to a judge. We see that subsequently lawyers needed uh, more skills. So education then uh, became uh, professionalized. And uh, we then see at the bottom, uh, mixed universities that came up where law moved into a university space, but it was for a long time treated as a lesser discipline. Something which is, I mean, when, when um, people in my generation or the earlier generation were doing law, we were often asked why didn't you get admission anywhere else? And many of you will uh, appreciate, I mean, empathize with that statement. So law was seen as a lesser discipline. Then we moved to uh, some single discipline universities of law, um, which, uh, which uh, started with the National Law School in Bangalore, but moved to others. And today we see that uh, the, uh, the new education policy talks about multidisciplinary universities. It talks about not being uh, a single discipline university, not being a law university or a medical university. It sees a uh, value in being multidisciplinary again. So in the beginning, we were wondering and we kept talking about in academic circles of whether we are going back uh, to mixed universities where law did not get an atten any attention. But I think from the context of justice education, this is not a bad thing. I think being multidisciplinary also means that you can draw from other systems. And yesterday's, uh, the first presentations showed us how in areas that we don't even think could be connected in India, like law, uh, you know, like the medical profession or um, a clinician being a nurse for a former nurse, for instance, uh, and having so much value to uh, the clinical education given is something that we should now start exploring. So having multidisciplinary universities and moving towards a multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary approach may not necessarily be a bad thing for legal education. And it is definitely not a bad thing for justice education. I think this will allow universities uh, to move, uh, to work better, uh, you know, together to get uh, more, uh, you know, more departments involved in uh, delivering justice education and will serve needs of uh, clients much better because people don't come to us with only a legal problem. They may come to us with a problem that involves many more solutions than just legal solutions, as we saw in yesterday's class, and as uh, Asha Bajpai pointed out in uh, today's presentation. So, um, to go forward, to go forward on this. Uh, where are we on the new, uh, the new education policy? And what are the factors that could affect justice education? One is, of course, first of all, the education policy may or may not receive widespread acceptance. I mean, as of now, not all states have accepted it. And even when we say that there has been acceptance, uh, are we really, uh, you know, we don't know whether this is going to translate into reality on the ground. So though, it has these uh, wonderful, um, you know, uh, wonderful uh, statements like we should have, um, you know, we should deliver justice education. We don't know uh, how people are going to react to it because legal education is not just 
Uh, I'm just going to wear this. I think there are some dogs barking outside. So legal education is not just in the realm of um, the uh, policy, but there are other organizations also which um, you know do play a major role. One is the Bar Council of India, which lays down not just the minimum criteria for the bar, but it could potentially lay down criteria for continuing legal education. Uh, it does talk about clinical legal education, but as uh, Asha Bajpai pointed out, there is a, a teaching bar, which means that if you are in full-time teaching, you cannot practice, and that affects uh, both clinical legal education and uh, justice education in India. We see that uh, when, it, when we're looking at regulation of uh, higher education institutions, there are a host of other bodies which may uh, play a role in uh, the way that organizations develop syllabi and run courses. There is an increasing um, uh, pressure on looking at law in silos, like, you know, looking at when you look at young students, they all say they want to be uh, corporate lawyers, you know, whatever that means. And I keep telling them that, you know, uh, being a corporate lawyer or uh, taking up a career in corporate law does not mean that you uh, can, can't do legal aid work, that you cannot do a clinic, that, you know, justice education does not matter. Justice education matters for everyone. And I think somehow when we are teaching in silos, when we are trying to become, you know, more professional, we are losing track of the fact that, you know, our profession was always uh, what we called a noble profession. Uh, and, you know, as law teachers, uh, you know, the satisfaction that we get is not just in telling students what cases, what books, but also to see them uh, create change on uh, the ground in, however, in whatever way is possible. So uh, as those who are involved in legal education, I think we are automatically, we should also keep in mind justice education. They should go together. Many teachers continue to see them as an either or, but uh, in some subjects at least. But I don't think uh, that holding is true and we should uh, try to integrate this better in our legal teaching. And that's the, really the biggest challenge that we have when um, there are, of course, challenges in running clinical courses, uh, there are challenges uh, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, funds available. There are challenges in personnel because we all uh, carry a very heavy burden of teaching hours compared to many other countries. However, I think if we look at, um, you know, what works, um, that is something that we should pick up. You know, we've seen uh, from Asha Bajpai's work and from um, Susan's work and from the work of others uh, yesterday, uh, and I'm sure Abhiraj will share some ideas as well, that if we, I mean, it, it should not be, it, it cannot, it is not a barrier to be able to uh, deliver justice education uh, in any way uh, possible, whether it is through legal literacy or it is through offering a host of courses, and the new education policy envisages that, not just traditional teaching, also legal literacy, as I would see it, also uh, massive open online courses, also um, you know, continuing legal education for lawyers, which is really not happening in our country, also uh, training uh, people in other disciplines um, to use law as an added uh, tool in their toolkit. I think that is really uh, the future of the policy. And if we are to implement the policy as um, people who are teaching in the legal sphere, it should be with a clear view towards justice education. Okay, uh, I've just about finished 15 minutes, but let me stop now uh, so that we have enough time for discussion. And uh, let me now pass this on back to Purvi. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Sarsu Thomas. Uh, it is uh, very uh, enlightening to know uh, how did how you trace the justice education issue from the new education policy. Uh, 
uh, you know, one of the most important aspects that I found from the new education policy is the autonomy that has been given to the learners. You know, the freedom and an autonomy for, you know, choosing the courses, you know, migrating from one course to others. And that really will help the interdisciplinary approach that all of us have been trying to develop for, for the last couple of decades. And probably when we talk about justice education at that point in time also, you know, we, we it, it will open a new doors for all of us to, you know, connect with other disciplines because justice is not something which only the law school has to work with, you know. When we talk about the justice professional and justice educators, we also take into consideration the other disciplines who are uh, promoting for the cause of justice. So I think that would really open a new door for all of us uh, to, to collaborate and to interconnect and, you know, to work together uh, with the other uh, schools, other disciplines. Uh, so thank you, Professor Sarsu Thomas. And now I invite, uh, um, I think we'll take all the questions at the end of uh, all the presentations. Uh, so I invite uh, Mr. Abhiraj Nayak. Uh, Abhiraj Nayak uh, is uh, one of the exceptional trainer and learners. Uh, I have, I mean, we have uh, had Abhiraj at Nirma University at a couple of occasions. Uh, and uh, the, the kind of uh, uh, experiential uh, learning pedagogy that he has been designing for all his uh, sessions is uh, really uh, remarkable. Uh, so Abhiraj, welcome to the sessions, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Purvi, and uh, uh, hello and uh, good day to everybody. Now, one of the challenges with being uh, the, the final speaker at uh, the end of a two-day symposium and speaking with an audience uh, who's uh, uh, many of whom are at the end of a long weekday is uh, you, you wonder about whether you have anything new to say or anything new to do at all, right? And, and that's my uh, frail position as I start on this presentation. And what I would like to do before I do anything else, I would uh, like to just invite as many friends as possible. I see there are 91 of us here in this space. I would like uh, to invite everybody to um, recognize that this is a constellation which is new. This is a, a, a space of energy where we are co-creating something. Uh, this is uh, a place where we can bring uh, our own full presence, our listening, our questions, our curiosities. And uh, uh, just to get us into a zone of, I, I think we have a little bit of time for questions and discussion uh, following my brief comments. So I, I want to uh, uh, see whether I can try and energize us despite uh, uh, this uh, virtuality that separates us. So uh, if you are open to the idea, I would like to propose a little bit of a game. Uh, and uh, it would be good if as many of you as possible uh, could turn on your videos if your bandwidth and your circumstances will allow, uh, just, just for three, four minutes to, to get through this game. And this game is a, 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 a game that involves passing on an imaginary object, right? And, and you can pass it on to anybody in the room. Uh, so just take a look, you have four screens. There are lots of people, slowly videos are coming on and people are waking up or coming out of the kitchen where they've been making some uh, yummy dinner for the day or yummy lunch. And people are like, okay, what's going on? There's a game here. So I'm going to take, I have this object here. Okay, my object is entirely under my control. And I'm going to pass this object on to someone else. And this object, because of this magical space that we are in, the space of justice education is always a magical space. When I pass it on, it changes when the next person touches it and it becomes something else, right? And, and what it becomes, I don't know. I only see the object. So what I have here is like this beautiful bird. It's gold with all kinds of colors. And I'm going to pass it on to Professor Susan. And I don't know what will happen to it. So Professor Susan is welcome to take it and pass it on to anyone else. 
Oh my goodness. So what a what an amazing gift. <laughs> I never thought I would ever receive such a gift and it would actually stay in my hands like that. Um, and so how, how beautiful and wonderful. Um, so I, uh, as I receive this, I, I don't know, the image that comes to mind is, is, um, is like a flower that I'm, I'm now, it is now a, a flower, um, and it is in full bloom, uh, even though it's winter time here in the U.S., um, and it is uh, still alive. It has its roots, and um, and uh, so we want to make sure that we take good care to keep it alive, um, and and put it in the soil very soon. And I'm going to pass it to uh, Professor Purvi. Thank you. The, you know, this flower turns into a chocolate today, and I'm <laughs> passing it on to Arpit. <laughs> Okay, now I receive this uh, particular object. Uh, now it's turning into a glass of juice. So now I pass it to uh, Amit, Professor Amit Kashyap. Professor, enjoying the juice. I think he's enjoying juice, yes. <laughs> Yeah, maybe, maybe Professor Kashyap is having such yes, yes. I could not unmute myself. So I receive it in the form of a chocolate because today is a chocolate uh, day. <laughs> so celebrating that, I forward it to Professor Arun Prashad. Wonderful ice cream. <laughs> Wonderful ice cream. I give it to, who is that? Who is that person? Anand Shinde. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Arun. I received ice cream, but uh, with me, it is like um, a fruit. Um, I pass it to, uh, let me see who is there. Uh, Sukrit. Yeah, so I received fingers also. You don't have to pass it on only to your friends. So this is an <laughs> Transcend yeah. boundaries, if you wish. Yes, Sukrit, please. Yeah, so I received a fruit and when it came to me, it transformed into a blank notebook and I'm giving it on to uh, Om. Please unmute yourself, Om. Uh, thank you for the blank notebook. Now, uh, this is a written one and this is actually a big volume which I could carry and thank you. So I pass it on to um, Shreya. Thank you Om for the big volume of the book. And now I think it has uh, transformed into a train and I pass a huge, huge, huge train to Kushal. Well, thank you, Shreya, for the train. I don't know how does one transform a train, but uh, okay. Uh, it has transformed into a cup of very strong coffee that I really need right now. <laughs> so uh, I pass it on to Pranav, sir. And I'll ask Pranav to pass it on back to me so we can move on. Where is Pranav? Uh, thanks uh, thanks uh, for this uh, cold coffee. And I'm sending again to the Abhairaj in the form of chocolate. Now this coffee has turned on, turned into chocolate again oh, and get back to you. It's so Thank beautiful. you so much. Thank you. This is a chocolate that has signs of being a flower and a train and an empty notebook and juice. And I will really treasure this chocolate and do wonderful things with it, I hope. Okay, so, so thanks friends for participating with me in a game of play. Uh, uh, it was... Uh, uh, for me, at least, nice to see the different things that came in from empty notebooks to uh, chocolate to flowers to uh, the fantastic train. Uh, I really loved the person who brought in a train into the room that really shows you what can be done uh, once you sort of agree that uh, the imaginative space allows for these things. And 
Uh, with the hope that you're feeling slightly energized, I'm going to very quickly launch into my presentation for today. So uh, do let me know if, the, if my screen is visible to you. Can you all, could you just show me a sign if uh, this no. is coming through? No, no, screen is not, not yet. Yeah, let me try once more. Do, do, do. Maybe I have to open it in a different format. Yeah. How about now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Super. <coughs> Someone has changed your screen to a black screen, you know. Is it? <laughs> no, it's okay. Okay, okay. Joking, joking. Yeah. joking. Yeah, black screen is also a good space. It's a space of possibility. Yeah, uh, because you reminded us, you know, Eric Byrne, game people play. So <laughs> good. Thank, thanks, Ajay. So, so let me uh, move us through uh, a few comments. And uh, as I said in, in my initial comment, uh, I come to this gathering uh, with, uh, with great humility uh, and uh, uh, in the spirit of learning from uh, each one of you. And I think uh, I have to start by just acknowledging um, uh, uh, each of the people who have spoken before me as part of uh, uh, this session. So, so Susan, for example, is someone whose work I was blown away by. Uh, I, I first encountered her at a, a Gage conference in Mexico. I still remember a handout I had from a session, rubrics for experiential learning that I sort of kept with me for many, many years and, and used with all of my uh, uh, experiential learning projects uh, at Azim Premji University. Uh, Professor Purvi is truly a, a visionary and, and I guess this is an example of uh, her visionary leadership. Uh, uh, She's been very kind in, in sort of uh, sort of acknowledging that Sanjay is, is something that uh, a lot of people have been involved with, but but effectively she has kickstarted or restarted what was uh, slowly uh, sort of hibernating. Uh, uh, the the network had begun; it had made some good progress, and then as the pandemic had its uh, uh, way with us, uh, we were all caught up in our own lives until. Suddenly, out of nowhere, Puri tells us she has this amazing lineup of people from all across the world who are going to come and talk to us about uh, justice education and, and shouldn't Sanjay be a, uh, the South Asia Network be a, uh, affiliated with it. So I've, I've constantly learned uh, from her, uh, from her leadership. Uh, both Asha ma'am and Sarsu ma'am are, are teachers. Asha ma'am uh, I haven't actually been in a class with her, but even as a young law student in, in Bangalore, uh, her book was famous, her work was famous, and uh, I was delighted uh, when many years later I got a chance to uh, collaborate with her. Uh, Sarsu Ma'am has been my teacher, uh, human rights teacher, human rights law, family law, and other courses at the National Law School. So, so in that sense, this is a, a very special opportunity for me to be with such luminaries and, and visionaries. And uh, so far, uh, it's been delightful. I've, I've already learned uh, so much just, just listening to uh, what each of the speakers have said. Now, uh, in my uh, comments, I, I really want to give you a sense of where I am after about 15 years of, of sort of uh, uneasy negotiation with this idea of, of justice education, right? And, and if I may include my years as a student, as a law student, it would be exactly 20 years where I've, I've had this, uh, this sort of desire for justice, to see a just world, to live justly, uh, to be uh, uh, mm, uh, at a, at, in a state of peace with myself, and uh, everything I've seen uh, with my eyes or heard with my ears or sensed with my senses has told me that uh, uh, there is no justice around, uh, right? Uh, the, the world is unjust. The world is full of suffering. The world is full of violence. And, and so 
Uh, where I am today is in a sense, uh, just acknowledging the importance of learning communities, right? I think for me, that is the core of uh, designing transformative justice education. How does one design an environment that allows for a community to learn from each other, with each other, uh, through each other, right? And, and I'm uh, delighted to uh, sort of uh, just share with you this, this very simple, but, but very, very cute uh, uh, and very, very authentic uh, visualization of what a learning community is, right? You, we just get together and we want to make a difference and we're all different sorts of people, right? Uh, uh, but we know that we uh, are interested in law and are interested in justice, and we would like to do something different in the world. And we see how we can share ideas, tools, tips, friendships, uh, even moral support with each other. And each one of us, either individually or in small groups, puts to use the things that we get from this community we see the effect, whoa, suddenly because I got a, 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 a mindfulness or a meditation technique, my work is so much better. I'm so much more alert when I'm in class or when I'm uh, in a particular context listening to a, a client, right? We see that effect and then we pass it back on to others who want to make it difference, right? So uh, in that sense, uh, this is in, uh, just, just I think, where transformative justice education has to go to. There has been an obsession with learning outcomes, right? And even uh, the uh, new education policy that Sarsu mentioned, or, or in general, at, at most universities across India, uh, the focus is on learning outcomes. And that is a good thing, because earlier we didn't even have learning outcomes to design our courses. And I would like to suggest that justice education is again pushing the frontier where it's no longer uh, necessarily the best thing to focus on outcomes as much as on the environment for those outcomes, right? And that's a subtle difference that I hope uh, will stay with you as, uh, as these comments uh, uh, are received. Now, what is transformative learning uh, I think is worth uh, spending a little bit of time with, right? And I bring in uh, uh, Sterling uh, and some some theoretical knowledge here. Uh, if you if you see uh, the third column, right, and you see the word at the real at the at the bottom, there's the word transformative, right? And uh, transformative learning which might be described also as epistemic learning is learning at the level of uh, a change in paradigms. You're seeing things differently when you're learning transformatively, right? Which is not the same as metacognition or cognition. It's not about you doing things more efficiently or effectively, right? Or it's not about you even examining and changing your assumptions about, uh, about law, about justice, about the role of human rights, right? It is about actually believing in the possibility of an entire new world, right? And that is what one would describe as a, a paradigmatic change. And, and just let's, let's uh, again acknowledge uh, one of my favorite uh, experiential educators, uh, Mahatma Gandhi, right? Uh, uh, as a young lawyer in South Africa, he just imagines the possibility of ashrams being sites or communities of transformative learning. And there's, there's no example to, to sort of uh, depend on. I mean, he, he draws from Tolstoy, but he's not really trying to get people to do their work better, or he's not trying to get people to even ask questions of what does it mean to be an Indian in South Africa? He's actually interested in how can we, as residents of an ashram, live in a different way, right? And that's how Satyagraha itself has its origins in South Africa through a lawyer who's interested in a community of practice, right? 
And, and that was a transformative vision, which I think uh, is important for all of us to attempt in however modest a way in our own context, in our own classrooms, in our own institutions. And again, uh, acknowledging Susan's profound point earlier today, at all three levels, at the personal level, at the inner level, at the interpersonal level, in our relationship with each and every person we speak with, and finally at the systemic level, right? So uh, that transformative possibility is there. And I'll invite you to just answer this question. You could do it early tomorrow in the morning when you wake up. When was the last time I tried something that was truly transformative in terms of a learning experience for another, right? Uh, not, not when did I try to uh, get someone to do something slightly better or to even question some assumptions, but when did I actually try to do something in a way that changed someone's life? Hmm? Uh, now, my own experience at Azim Premji University, I don't want to spend too much time on this really populated slide, but I, I do want to give you uh, uh, the journey that I am still on in that sense uh, at, at the uh, Azim Premji University, which uh, is not a law school. We don't even have a law school. The only thing we have a, a, an LLM in law and development, and we are developing an LLM on human rights and social justice lawyering, right? I'm, I'm not even sure if I'm allowed to say that, but it's too late now. I've, I've, shared, I've shared that news, and I think uh, uh, in the spirit of open access and collaboration, that should be okay. And the journey since I was part of the university, in, uh, since I joined the university in 2012, but I began this experiential learning experiment uh, circa 2014, we started with four clinics and we used the legal clinic model. And then we didn't have law students. So we just had development studies, master's students. And uh, over the last seven years from four clinics, we've expanded, we've moved out of the clinic model. We no longer think of what we're doing as law clinics, though our debt to clinics will always be there. And we're now working on a project model, right? It's uh, uh, above and beyond clinic in that sense. Right? And we work with law and public policy students. These law students and public policy students work together as part of small groups. They're not separated. It would be good to bring in even more disciplines in. And uh, the learnings for, for me have been that the program, and it's a compulsory part of a, a master's program. It's a six credit LLM requirement, this project the project, small groups work on one project over nine months. Hmm? That's the nature of the project experience. Uh, the achievements have been that our learners now appreciate that uh, uh, law and courts and legislations and lawyers are usually operating in complex, messy, and polycentric uh, theaters, right? So it's not easy white and black. It's not an easy, you press a button and justice comes around. Students now know that it's uh, complex, messy and polycentric. Students are now somewhat uh, comfortable with operating in situations of radical uncertainty, right? Uh, some students uh, broke down a few times over the course of their project. They were like, so uh, we want to meet this uh, district collector and for three months, he's not even letting us enter the door. How can we do a project like this? And uh, the response to that was, that is the nature of bureaucracy in India, right? What can you do with that? How can you problematize that? How can you make something out of that frustration, right? And so students gradually got more comfortable operating in situations of uncertainty, which as we are all discovering uh, with COVID is an important life skill, right? And uh, business leaders all talk about now volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous context, right? VUCA context of operation. And it's important to give lawyers, especially lawyers working for justice, the ability to operate in such situations of uncertainty. Students have been able to appreciate legal and policy issues in the context of power and broader social relations. 
and of course finally we now have a compulsory experiential program and a clear model for it and that with other universities other law schools have gotten interested in the model so they've asked us for our documents and they've tried to experiment with the same which makes us feel good that we're, we're trying something that uh, uh, is drawing the attention of others as well right challenges of course have been this stuff is expensive and uh, it's not easy to get money for this in india right there is there is a particular uh, 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 sort of conservativeness in hey i can't spend a lot of money with students traveling around and living in some hotel somewhere or camping out or, or or really hiring other consultants so many universities and leaders will not put money down they'll be like oh we can we can't give you too much money but we can let you do a little something right that's the that's been one challenge a second everyone wants to control it even if it's happening uh, the old way the old uh, lecture format the theoretical format the i will tell you what to do and you are an empty vessel into whose head i will pour the knowledge uh, that uh, that paradigm of power continues to try and capture the space of uh, justice education in an experimental sense right and it's always a battle and this is something that all clinical legal educators are very familiar with and of course it takes time right it's uh, it's not easy to uh, transform the world and uh, uh, sort of finding that time in students busy schedules in uh, teachers busy schedules a clinical uh, or a justice educator and the time she puts in is often not acknowledged uh, uh, in the same way as okay you have completed a course so you have taken 50 classes right uh, uh, how does one actually acknowledge the kind of work that a clinician or a justice educator puts in? Uh, allowing each project to be unique and fully student-owned, right? That is a desire, but that runs uh, conflicts with an institutional approach to uniformity. Um, defining minimum requirements, right? Uh, and and uh, Professor Asha has for long been uh, uh, an expert uh, and uh, a clarion call for the need for standards, right? What, what are the minimum requirements for what a project intervention should include? Uh, some uh, faculty educators are not so interested in justice. They're more interested in efficiency, engineering, or technical solutions, even within the legal fold. So convincing them that it's worth pursuing justice as an educational model. And of course, synchronizing all of this uh, within a, a very packed academic schedule. So I'll just uh, begin to wind my comments up and show you this is the Environment Protection Clinic uh, that uh, in, I began with a long time back in 2014, right? And you'll see on the left that students did a bunch of things. They made a documentary. They organized a workshop. This was far away from where the university was. They actually traveled to the border of Kerala, Tamil Nadu, Gudalur, and they organized a workshop uh, with tribal leaders and Gram Sabha leaders. Right? They did a legal mapping. That comic strip that you see on top is again an output. Right? Uh, they made an information handbook. And most importantly, all of this is available on a website. Right? So I can still show this to anyone. The students have gone. Some of them I'm not in touch with. But I made sure, and they made sure, that they recorded their work through a website that, that stays as an artifact. Right? Similarly, this Ecological Justice Field Project, they came up with a beautiful litigation brief on the last free-flowing river in Karnataka, the Aganashini. And uh, 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 this this litigation brief has been useful. Uh, the Aganashini uh, River has now been protected. Even now, the chief minister of Karnataka wants to build a port there. And so what these students did uh, was relied upon by a bunch of other activists three years after the students finished their work. Right? Uh, more recently, students came up with a policy brief on climate action and mobility in Bangalore. Uh, in 2017, and this is when I first uh, met Purvi Madam, uh, with many colleagues, we organized this exhibition, and I'll encourage everybody to check out this blog, craftingjustice.wordpress.com. Uh, 
uh, it is uh, very, very comprehensively documented. Some doyens of education, including Upendra Bakshi ji and uh, uh, Nandini Sundar and others, uh, their interviews, Jane Shukowski's interview, all of that is on, uh, on the website. Mm, and it was a good experience bringing together uh, experiential educators, practitioners from different disciplines, including artists, so on and so forth, right? So where I am today is I'm just trying to still sit with this question of uh, what does it actually mean to do, do and be interested in justice education, right? And uh, uh, I too remember Dr. Madhav Menon today uh, 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 and his contribution to justice education. I think uh, uh, we as uh, uh, justice educators in India and the global South have so much writing and documentation to do, right? It's, there are huge gaps. Uh, uh, very little has been documented, very little has been written. Uh, this is my challenge to all of us. Uh, and I think Susan has already given us a bit of an answer, right? For me, uh, the biggest challenge is that experiential education continues to be incomplete often. It continues to be, uh, you know, there, there's a bit of dissonance. Okay, I had this project, I had this clinic, I provided that legal aid, but then the students graduated. The world didn't change, it stayed how it was. How do I, what do I do with that, right? And I think uh, just acknowledging that uh, the more attention you give something, the more importance it has within the system might be one way of thinking about it. So I'll end my comments with that. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for your patience and attention. And please do keep in touch. Uh, back to you, Purvi, madam. I hope I have not taken too much time. No, no, we are on time. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm sorry, Professor Susan has a class, so uh, she had to leave. So uh, we conveyed uh, our uh, gratitude to her for uh, her uh, valuable and enlightening presentation. So. Yes, now uh, let's make this uh, floor open for interactions, for questions and uh, observations, comments, whatever you feel like sharing over here. You may uh, drop in a message on the chat box or you may unmute yourself and you can share your observation. I don't think so. We have uh, any questions on the chat box. I was just trying to read it. Yes, but that's all, all of the, that's all about the comment on the exercise. Yes. So anything any participants would like to share or probably it's uh, all of you are feeling that it's a really a long day and uh, you all seem to be a little tired. So but still, if you want to share any observations or comments, please feel free. So, ma'am, this okay. is Surekha this side. Thank you for the, all the panelists, if I'm able to. Uh, I mean, am I audible to all of you, perhaps? Yes. So, um, thank you all of you for giving this insight, great insights about how our law legal system has to improve to meet social justice. Um, I was just wondering that, to fight for social justice, we definitely need legal knowledge, but at the same time, we need legal, a, a kind of backing and support for the people who want to do social justice work, which is absent. So um, can the universities who are teaching legal education can give some kind of scholarship for students who want to do social justice work after they pass out for at least for one year to concentrate on the zones on which they want to work. The moment they move into a major world, world outside, they are uh, struggling for earning for their livelihood, establishing themselves as for the family requirements, et cetera. In the process of that, the social justice does not meet them or neither they meet social justice. So this was one of the observations that I was just wondering that how could we include that passion of the students to sustain in longer run? Yeah, any one of you would like to respond? Okay, may I, Professor Purvi, may I say something? Yeah, please, please, please. I think this was a, this is a very good question. It was a good idea of Professor Menon in one of the workshops that we had 
we we he felt he was of the view that after graduation the student there should be some at least three to five scholarships for at least five years for students who want to pursue justice education or justice lawyering community lawyering and they should be supported uh, by in their office in their ad costs in their administrative cost he was of that view but somehow it didn't go through and uh, i didn't work out that much but that idea was there with him and we did sit and uh, developed a blueprint for that long back it was some years back around 10 years back i think yeah yeah uh um a uh, faculty colleague bini had uh, some concern bini why don't you unmute yourself and share your question and comment bini are you there you may unmute yourself and you can share your comment yeah she says that she is unable to unmute ma'am oh, oh okay okay are you can you just look into this yes ma'am i just uh, contact the host ma'am no you need to unmute her Ma'am, host has this uh, right uh, because uh, being a co-host. I'll check, ma'am. Okay, let me try to read her question. Uh, yeah. Yeah. the question is for the panel in general uh, speaking for one uh, for or on behalf of the other for ensuring justice is appreciable the question is how one does that without taking away from the others agency especially if it is a deprived and unequal other remembering remembering gayatri's work uh, but still relevant concern is can be a subletin can this subletin speak also there is the implicit danger of empathy turning into an uh, epistemic claim when i try to represent the other simply by okay i'm not able to read i'm sorry simply by empathizing yeah yeah empathizing yeah. i cannot claim i know the others plight and talk often yes. with some epistemic uh, arrogance about, about and for the, the other yeah so uh, anyone would like to respond to this or bini if you want to make uh, yourself more clear you can do so uh, i mean it's a uh, difficult yeah uh, I, the question is uh, yeah i i think i i could uh, are you able to hear me now i finally managed to unmute myself so yeah, the yeah. question is see when we try to speak on behalf of the other you know saying that we empathize and especially when we are talking about the other who is in a hierarchically lower stature than us you know other deprived other the voiceless other the silenced other so any claim of empathizing with the other and uh, turning that uh, claim of empathy into a knowledge claim i empathize hence i know right and representing the other or being the voice of the other speaking on behalf and for the other so it raises certain concerns though it is done in good spirit and good will the problem is uh, something similar to what gayatri spivak spoke in her essay can the subaltern speak because when we try to give our voice to the subaltern we are depriving the subaltern the agency as a subject so are we justified in representing the unequal other to an extent of taking away the other's agency that's the question and how do we do that how do we represent the other without depriving the other of his or her agency
I think, I mean, that's, that's a very valid question. I'm not sure if I have like answers to it uh, completely. Uh, but as far as uh, justice education is concerned, this is, you know, definitely something that we should caution students about. I can give you one example. Um, I remember we had, we had done, um, you know, a one month program in a university talking about human rights education and um, you know, how they could help. So the class decided to do, I mean, much after the program was over, they decided to do, uh, you know, a legal literacy program in a village, uh, which is a good thing. I mean, people should know what their rights are. And then there was one situation, one a person there who came, woman came there who came and said, look, I'm facing domestic violence. What do I do? And they were like, no, no, you come with us. We will take care of you, you know? So um, then of course the teacher had the wisdom to step in and say, no, let's see what she wants. And, uh, you know, let's, um, uh, you know, let, let her speak about uh, what should be done because they were all, you know, all enthusiastic about taking her to file an FIR and, you know, everything else. So definitely when, you know, when we, um, uh, whether it is a younger student or it is ourselves, I mean, we are of course in uh, a lot of danger of, I mean, about what you have said, which is why I think you know, programs like legal literacy may give uh, a framework where a person can exercise their own agency and take a decision of, you know, uh, this is what I want to do. Um, how validly it is their choice and how much an external agency has had a role to play, I cannot say. But I mean, that your uh, Spivak's criticism and you know your point always remains valid. And I think it's a caution that we should uh, keep in our minds. But uh, trying to find you know a broad answer to it, you know, I, I would say I would not be able to do. You know, I know this doesn't help, but. I completely agree with what you're saying. Thank you. Thanks. I, I too would like to come in here. Uh, thanks, uh, Sarsu and uh, Bini for the for the comments. And I think it's it's a very useful provocation um, uh, to 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 sort of constantly alert us of the of the risks and the limits of even even a, a, a universal uh, Western construct of human rights and emancipation, right? And I think. Uh, uh, I think the answer is partly to be found even within Spivak's work. So, so Spivak uh, suggests uh, that an uncoercive rearrangement of desire might be one way of uh, allowing the subaltern to speak. And what she means by that is, uh, how do I actually learn from, learn with these people who uh, others are trying to help, right? And, and so Spivak as an activist is working uh, with these schools uh, where she's speaking Bengali uh, only and she is uh, mm, uh, she's there as someone who's learning from this who would normally be a beneficiary and and uh, uh, I mean without necessarily Spivak can be a for, 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 for formidable read uh, uh, author to, to negotiate for students, but I, I find uh, this article by uh, doc, Dr. Abhay Bang in, uh, uh, you know, the uh, development review, uh, putting people at the heart of research, a very, very easy read, but also a very, very powerful read. You know, how does one do research with instead of research on or research for? How does one do research with? Uh, and I think that that is something we must bring into our, uh, our justice education as well. And, and students can do it. Let's not assume that they can't. I mean, my students uh, were working for street vendors, but finally uh, the street vendors themselves took charge of, of what the project was trying to do. And uh, the students uh, were, were mature and sensible enough to see that that was the right thing to do. Thank you. So one of that's, you know, putting this thing, when we talk about justice educations and, uh, you know, these kind of work, empowering others, you know, the empowerment per se would take care of uh, these issues to a large extent. So thank you, uh, Abhiraj. Thank you, 
Professor Sarsu, if any other observation? Ma'am Surekha here again. Yes. Um, this is question for Abhay Razvi. I know that this has been a little late, but yeah, this is there. Now you have given a lot of examples as how your students are influencing the areas that where you are working. Um, but at the same time, I was just wondering whether these groups which are vulnerable, which are being stagnated at the point where they are, are they able to raise up is the question. There's a lot of movement that we do in universities and many other places to say that there's a there's a movement of people, students who are working for justice, but is it justice being done to these communities in real sense by which they can be a part of justice system itself? I was reading one of the reports. A lot of the people who have been into legal education, there is not much uh, from the lower caste, lower societies are in coming into legal education, which is, which is a feedback to all of us in some way that there is something missing it out. And also that now if you've given this street, uh, street vendors, this one, I do not know how do you solve this. The majority of the street vendors working for something and there is one person who's not willing to do it. Again, we are falling into a majority versus minority population over there in providing justice. So I do not know how you work on that. It's the second part of the question, actually. Thank, thank you for the comments. And I think uh, uh, both Professor Asha and Professor Sarsu will be able to offer far more wise words. Uh, what uh, The only thing that I have to say is, uh, let's be patient with everyone, including ourselves. You know, it's uh, finally, um, we are a young uh, republic. Uh, I mean, we, we might be an old civilization, but as a republic and as a new legal order, uh, we are quite very young, you know, and uh, we are still in a process of decolonizing our minds and our bodies. Um, and and uh, I think hope is very, very important. Uh, I mean, even Paulo Freire uh, talks of the pedagogy of hope. So uh, celebrating the small wins, you know, even if one person's life changes as a result of a, a clinical project or as a result of what you do as a teacher or what you do as a student, uh, that's good enough. I mean, to be honest, I will I'll sleep okay if I know that my work is changing even one person's life. And uh, if each person thinks like that, uh, we can we can move mountains. So having patience and uh, seeing the positive, because there is a lot of positive as well, uh, I think would be what I have to say on the matter. And I would definitely be keen to hear from both Asha and Sarsu on how, how they uh, deal with the challenge of doing justice work because they've been doing it for so much longer than I have. Yes, uh, what I feel is that you have your own emotions. All of us have our own emotions. And many of these emotions are, we can always relate to the others when we meet them. Many a times we may not have actually gone through what they are going through, but we do feel when we see the vulnerability of people, when we work with them, their emotions, their pain, do we do understand, we do relate. And for that, what I realized was mindfulness, as Susan was mentioning, is very important to, do, to deal with such situations. I remember when I first, I was asked by the Bombay High Court to go and meet um, uh, certain people in the, certain children in the institutions throughout Maharashtra in various districts. Children used to come and, you know, hold my uh, dress and ask me, please take us out from here. Please take us out from here. I mean, that was my first, uh, I'm talking about my several years back in 90s, I think, uh, when the uh, Justice A.P. Shah was in the Bombay High Court. He had asked me to go. And what, they, when they started pulling at me and say, take us out, I mean, I felt I'm coming here, uh, making a report and then going back. What am I doing for them? They want me to take them out, but I couldn't do that. But their emotions, their feelings, I did feel, and I was, and I, it did hurt me later when I went back to my room. I shared with my other team members. I said, "See, I can't. I mean, it's very difficult for me to to overcome all that I have gone through today." This was my first feeling, my first emotions. So vulnerability, your own emotions, your own feelings, your own mindfulness, how you go through it. I think that makes a difference when you're doing justice work. Um, just to quickly add, 
uh, I mean, I can understand, you know, we should not be complacent, uh, definitely, but uh, it is difficult to, you know, not be impatient at times like this. Uh, we often feel that, you know, the little we are doing should be scaled up in some way and, you know, we should uh, make a huge difference. It may, may, may happen in some cases, and uh, in many cases, you know, the progress may be slow. And what we do as teachers, we are not going to see uh, the effects of it right now. But having been teaching now for, I mean, since 90, uh, 97, so I, I, I can't, I don't know how many years, maybe 25 years. Uh, I see now, you know, students who are moving into uh, the social sector, students who are moving into uh, doing many kinds of meaningful work. And I've seen that, uh, you know, this has changed over time. And students have taken strange paths. They may have joined the corporate sector for some time, then moved into, gone abroad to study, come back to public policy, gone into justice, uh, uh, you know, justice work. So um, people's paths are very different. But I think as teachers, what we also need to do is tell people, look, there is another way. You may choose one way today, but, you know, uh, both are not, mutually opposing. There is a lot of good you can do. And um, while there have been some good experiments of uh, scaling up, as Abhay says, uh, and as uh, Asha pointed out, even if it is, you know, helping a few people, uh, we should go, we should not be uh, worried about that. We should go about uh, doing it. You know, I um, remember as a student, there was this quote of, I think, Mother Teresa, which used to be uh, quoted to us all the time, saying that uh, we ourselves feel that what we are doing is just a drop in the ocean, but the ocean would be uh, that much less because of that missing drop. So uh, even if it is a drop, it is uh, well worth it because someone is uh, has received, someone's life is better because of the work that uh, you have done or your students have done at some point of time. So I don't think that should worry us too much. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you uh, all. I think we 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 conclude and uh, because uh, it's it's we we have been going on for the last uh, two more than two year, two hours. So thank you, Professor Asa Bajpay. Thank you, uh, Abhiraj Nayak, and thank you, Professor Sarsu Thomas, uh, for joining us today. And thank you all the participants for your patients uh, here listening and your involvement and engagement in the entire process. Thank you all. And we look forward to have uh, all of you together discussing and deliberating on the justice education issues in other event, probably that what Sanjay would like to propose in uh, future. So at this juncture, I also, uh, you know, put my compliments on record to my colleague, uh, Mr. Arpit Sharma, uh, assistant professor with uh, Institute of Law, and my colleague, uh, Professor Varsha Ganguly for taking the pain for the arrangement and coordinating the entire event. So thank you all. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Professor Purvi. Thank you. Good night. Good night.